how is it? Did you hear that question in the middle of it? I got some how is it. How is it that all snow crystals have six sides? How is it that one side of the Grand Canyon gets more snow on average every year than the city of Minneapolis? I get it, Andrew. She's waving at me. How is it that a giraffe can go longer without water than a camel? How is it that the directions of that are contained in the genes of a single cell are enough to fill ten volumes of the Encyclopedia Britannica? How is it? Been asking that question a long time. How is it then that each of us can hear them speaking in our native language? How is it? As human knowledge has advanced over the two millennia, the average person's body of knowledge, facts, figures, dates, those kinds of things, formulas, becomes more and more vast. Yet we still haven't been able to overcome the how is it stuff in life. It's in those how is it times in life that people of faith will find something very profound. And it's this. Doesn't matter how much our knowledge increases, we can never fully explain away Almighty God. Nor can we ever fully explain God. God is the God of the how is it? How is it that a 17 year old young woman, when was this? 15 years ago, probably, Carol? A young girl who's ready to graduate from high school goes in right after the holidays for some very simple surgery for a deviated septum. She was having trouble sleeping, snoring at night. She was congested most of the time. And so she went into the hospital for surgery to repair a deviated septum. Her mom was an RN, had been for years. And I get a phone call. I had been there right before the surgery, was there right after, and a few days later her mom calls me and says, she's not responding. How is it that in all the sterile environment of a hospital, some little piece of bacteria or virus gets up through the nasal canal and attacks her brain and sends her into a coma? How is it? And so for the next four to six weeks, I would go by several times a week and check in with the mom and the daughter who was in one of those beds that's constantly moving so you don't get bed sores. She was hooked up to oxygen. She was being kept alive by machines. This went on for about six weeks and I walked in one morning. Her mom would find an empty room and sleep there every night. And I walked in about six weeks later one day, and her mom was in tears. Because the doctors had just left, and they had come into her and said, look, there's no brain activity. Your daughter is basically being kept alive by machines. And they said, we think it's time for you to make funeral arrangements and to consider pulling the plug. Well, you and I can imagine what that does to the parent of a 17-year-old girl who has life uh, ahead of her. She was distraught. And so we went and we found a quiet room and we prayed together. And then we spent considerable time in silence, just meditating, just listening. And I broke the silence. I said to her, you know what? I'm not getting anything. And I think what that means is 
the spirit is telling me this child has been hooked up to machines for six weeks. What difference would 24 more hours make? Let's not make a decision. Let's continue in prayer the rest of the day. And let's ask God to help us make the decision. And so we hugged and parted and she stayed there with her daughter. I went on to the rest of the things I had to do that day. I walked in the next morning. And you know what I'm going to tell you. About an hour before, that 17-year-old girl had opened her eyes and tried to talk. But she couldn't talk because she was intubated. And about a month later, she went to rehab. And a couple of months after that, she was able to go home. And every Sunday after that, she and her mom were in church. And, and they were right down in the, the front couple of pews. There was a space for a wheelchair in front. And they would sit right behind it. Because every Sunday now, and several times a week, that 17-year-old girl would have a minor seizure. And her mom would just slide out of her chair and hold her daughter in her lap until the seizure passed in a few moments. How is it that a 17-year-old girl is told by doctors, basically, we're going to pull the plug, you don't have a chance. And then she recovers. We insult the Holy Spirit by insisting that everything is quantifiable and explainable. It's like the guy that, whose dog had learned a new trick. And he and the dog were walking along the beach one day, and he looks up, and here comes another fellow walking towards him. So he thinks, ah, this guy's going to be impressed. He picks up a piece of driftwood, and boy, he chunks it as far out in the ocean as he can, just as the guy gets up to him. The dog jumps up, takes off after the driftwood on top of the water. Only the pads of his feet get wet. As he goes out there, retrieves the driftwood, he comes back on top of the water, drops the driftwood at the man's feet. And the guy looks at the other man and says, hey, did you notice anything? And the other guy says, yeah, your stupid dog doesn't know how to swim, does it? <laughs> That's what we do with the Holy Spirit in our fear or our lack of knowledge. Our mathematical and our scientific bias has led us to believe that we are humans who have occasional spiritual experiences. But the truth that was proclaimed by Jesus Christ and by his actions and his resurrection and by the Holy Spirit at Pentecost is just this. We are spiritual beings who happen to be having a temporary human experience. How is it that we've forgotten that? There have always been those who fear the how is it of God. Listen to them. They were all surprised and bewildered. Some of them asked each other, what does this mean? Others jeered at them and said, ah, they're full of new wine. They're three sheets to the wind. They're smashed. They're oiled. They're bombed. You see, those folks were around that day. They were probably around when Jesus turned the water into wine at that wedding in Cana in Galilee. But they weren't the ones who would be enjoying the wine and praising God, I guarantee you, they were the ones that were trying to turn the wine back into water so they could repeat a scientific experiment with it. Not a clue what the Holy Spirit was about. Humankind has become so rational, so scientific, that now we're afraid to be astonished by God. We're fearful of the fact that God will amaze us if we just let him. John Wesley, preaching in the fields of England as people fell on their knees and wept and came to Christ and rebirth. 
Do we somehow think that that's the result of a mathematical formula? Do we somehow think that it's explainable using math or science? No. What happened was a powerful movement of the Holy Spirit of Almighty God leading people to ask, how is it? The millions of new Christians who are being made right now, not in America, unfortunately, but most of them are being made in Southeast Asia and Africa and Latin America. That is not the result of some kind of infectious airborne miracle let loose from a test tube somewhere. It is a powerful movement of the Holy Spirit leading people to ask, how is it that my life's not more satisfying? As long as you and I ask, how is it? But we ask it out of a sense of intellectual pride and superiority. As long as I seek to dominate the Holy Spirit with my personal knowledge, the Holy Spirit is never going to fully indwell me. That's our major problem in the United Methodist Church and in the Christian Church today in America. The Holy Spirit does not indwell us with power and with purpose and with joy. And as long as it's not, we continue to water down the fine wine of God's presence in our own lives. So how? How is it that we can tap into the power of God for some how is it in our own life? Listen. Listen to what Peter told the folks quoting the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will, not I might, I will pour out my spirit, not on some people, on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young will see visions. Your elders will dream dreams. I will pour out my spirit. You can go back to the Hebrew. Joel didn't say, I will pour out my spirit on the liberals or the brain dead fundamentalists. I will pour out my spirit on Democrats or Republicans. I will pour out my spirit on Methodists or Catholics or Presbyterians. That's not what Joel said. I'm going to pour out my Holy Spirit on all people. How is it that we don't realize that? How is it that we're afraid of it? Well, for one thing, we've got to get rid of the notion in our mind that the Holy Spirit is the stuff of snake handling, frothing at the mouth, backwoods types. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, not some flesh. The second obstacle, as I see it, to properly being empowered by the Holy Spirit is in how we handle the concept of the phrase, the last days. Because it says in the last days, I'm going to pour out my spirit. If you and I convince ourselves that the last days means the time just before Jesus returns to snatch us all up, then guess what? You and I are free to wait. We're free to procrastinate on a spirit-filled relationship with God through Jesus. Heck, after all, the sun hasn't turned dark and the moon's not full of blood yet. So I can put a deep, spiritual, Holy Spirit kind of relationship on a back burner. It's not the last days yet. But the truth of the matter is this. Those last days began with the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the exclamation point was put on them on the day of Pentecost. And you and I are living right smack dab in the middle of the last days. Right now. The last days are here. So is the Holy Spirit. So if you're waiting on Jesus to come back and sap you with the Holy Spirit, you are misinformed, my friend. The Spirit has been available to you since the day of Pentecost 2,000 years ago. And if, like a recent survey would suggest, 82% of Americans still say they believe miracles are possible by the power of Almighty God, 
then why in the heck don't we live like they are? The answer is, we're still living as human beings having occasional spiritual experiences on our own terms. We have been treating the Holy Spirit like broccoli. Little girl goes to have a sleepover at her friend's house. Mom comes up right before dinner and asks the, the visiting little girl, Sweetheart, do you like broccoli? The little girl says, Oh, I love broccoli. So Mom prepares a meal, and after supper, she's collecting the dishes from the table and the visiting little girl's plate. Not one bite of broccoli has left the plate. So she goes to her, and she says, Sweetheart, I thought you told me you loved broccoli. And the little girl says, yes, ma'am, I don't love it. I just don't love it enough to eat it. <laughs> <laughs> Substitute Holy Spirit for broccoli. That's where we are. For most Christians, the Holy Spirit is broccoli and we love him. We just don't love him enough to let him invade our life and empower our living. That's how we feel about evangelism, too. The opening sermon at the General Conference of the United Methodist Church, which started this last week, was delivered by Bishop Gregory Palmer. And all these thousands of delegates from all over the world heard him say pretty much the same thing. He said, folks, we are a denomination steeped in mission. We send mission people all over the world, to Haiti, to Africa. We open food pantries and clothes closets. And we do missions. So why are we dying? We're dying because we don't do evangelism. The very thing that the Holy Spirit inspires us to do. We go off to Africa and we weld or we hammer and we nail and we come back and we feel oh so good about ourselves. But have we ever asked one person to come to church to become a follower of Jesus Christ? Have we ever told one person what Christ has meant in our life? Heck no. But we feel good about ourselves because we go on a mission trip somewhere. And Bishop Palmer said, folks, Mission work should be number two. The great commission at the end of the book of Matthew, Christ tells his followers, go out to the ends of the earth and make disciples. He doesn't say weld. He doesn't say hammer and nail. He doesn't say give people injection. All wonderful things. But without the primary thing being to bring people into the kingdom, the church is dying. That's why there's empty pews in here right now. People don't want to talk about Jesus and the Holy Spirit. We treat him like broccoli. We love the Holy Spirit. We just don't love him enough to consume him or allow him to consume him. us. Jesus, in Matthew's Gospel, says this. And I like the way the Common English Bible reads it. Matthew 12, verse 31, Therefore I tell you that people will be forgiven for every sin and insult to God, but insulting the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. And if we speak a word against the Son of God, it will be forgiven. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit won't be forgiven, not in this age or in the age to come. I remember when I was a kid, that scripture used to scare the tar out. Because I would wander around wondering what I said that ticked off the Holy Spirit. Because any minute I was going to be burning in hell. <laughs> what insults the Holy Spirit? Leaving it out of your life. Not letting Him work in and through you to bring others into the kingdom. That's the greatest insult to the Holy Spirit that I can think of. And it's why so many mainline denominations are dying today. We have forgotten 
to tell the gospel story and to offer other people Christ, as John Wesley, our founder, said. Amen. There's good news, though. Mm -hmm. The good news is this. The Holy Spirit is available this day and every day for new life, for new meaning, new purpose, new joy, new depths that you and I have never dreamed of. We said to open ourselves up. We've been too busy thinking about new programs, new campaigns, and new missions, and forgetting about evangelism. I had a member of this church, my first Sunday come to me and said, yeah, we do a great job of missions, but we're lousy at evangelism, and it's going to kill us. We just have to open ourselves up to the Holy Spirit. We just have to start living as spiritual beings who are having a temporary human experience. And like Mom always told us, the main thing we need to do is to eat our cotton pick and broccoli. <laughs> Jesus said, let those who have ears to hear you. Amen. Amen.